Good morning, friends. Welcome to Potomac United Methodist Church on this third Sunday of the Easter season. I'm Pastor Laura. We have one gospel lesson to read this morning, and it continues the way Luke tells the story of the resurrection of Christ. Uh, we'll go into that in the sermon this morning. So let me just say that I'm going to be reading from Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. And it's the story of two disciples who are walking on the road to Emmaus. Now on the same day, that is the day of the resurrection, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles away from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talk and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked among them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, whose name was Cleopas, asked Jesus, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and who doesn't know what's happened here over the last few days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is now the third day since all of this took place. Some of our women amazed us earlier today. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they couldn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart you are to believe all the things that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost done. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and ate it with them. And as they began to eat it, their eyes were open and they recognized him, and immediately he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven and those with them assembled together. And they said, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. to sleep Some nights I lie awake counting gifts instead of counting sheep I've got a heart that can hold love I've got a mind that can think there may be times when I lose the light and let my spirit sink, but I can't stay depressed when I remember how I'm blessed, grateful, grateful, 
truly grateful I am. Grateful, grateful, truly blessed and duly city of strangers. I've got a family of friends. No matter what rocks and brambles fill the way, I know that they will stay until the end. I feel a hand holding my hand. It's not a hand you can see, but on the road to the promised land, this hand will shepherd me through delight and despair, holding tight and dream of more, but giving thanks for what I've got makes me so much happier than keeping score in a world that can bring pain. I will still take each chance, for I believe that whatever the terrain stones life may sling. We can moan or we can sing. Grateful I am. Grateful, grateful, truly blessed and do In 1925, a small newspaper in the town of Louisville, Kentucky, decided to uh, put on a uh, spelling bee for the kids in the town. That was the beginning of what has morphed into the National Spelling Bee, which is like the national sport for nerds. And I say that with great love. It's amazing, isn't it, every year to watch hundreds of kids with uh, numbers pinned to their shirts stand to the microphone and uh, spell words you and I have never even heard of. Come on, be, be honest with me, uh, along with me. I don't think I'd have made it past a school spelling bee, much less the regional or the national spelling bees. These kids are amazing. Uh, as amazing as any other trained athlete. For most of them, I was reading a story this week, and for most of them, they began reading the dictionary when they were 10 and 11 years old just to prepare, 1925. And every year since then, except uh, during, the, during World War II, 1943 to 1945, and this year, it's been called off because of the COVID-19. So in honor of the kids who prepared so hard to be in the National Spelling Bee this year, uh, I have learned a new word 
its meaning and how to spell it. So here it is. The word is proleptic, P-R-O-L-E-P-T-I-C, proleptic. It's a word that means anticipating an argument that might be coming and uh, writing in such a way that you answer the questions before they have even been asked. Proleptic. Some scholars suggest that Luke wrote his gospel proleptically. That when he wrote his gospel in the first century church, he was anticipating in that gospel some questions that would arise as people at different times in their lives came to a faith in Jesus Christ. So at this point in the third gospel, only the women and Simon Peter have had a taste of the empty tomb. And the way Luke builds the story, it's layer upon layer, as if he's casting a net, hoping to catch us in faith, hoping to catch us in one of their, their stories of coming to believe about Jesus. See, the, the stories of the resurrection were added one at a time, really, throughout this day that Luke tells us about, and throughout the history of the early church. One story told upon another until an entire community of faith shared that story as their own story of faith. With his words, he fans out and tries to catch us. That's Luke writing proleptically. So let me get a running start to tell you where we are in his Gospels, 24th chapter. Uh, Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried in the tomb. His body was laid deep in a tomb and a huge boulder was rolled across the entrance on the first day of the week at the, at the moment that the Sabbath is over with the rising of the sun. A group of women, and, and Luke is one of the ones who identifies this group of women, Mary of Magdala, Joanna, uh, Mary, the, uh, the mother of one of the other disciples, uh, they all come together, a whole flock of women along with them come together to anoint the body of Jesus, the man, who they're sure they're going to find in the tomb. And they come back all worked up. They come back with stories of, of angels or ghosts or men in white, depending on which one you're talking to and how much you can understand of their words coming all garbled together out of the excitement. The only part of the story I think that must have been clear is that the body is gone and the women are sure that they have seen something that some voice has told them that Jesus is no longer there. So in Luke's gospel, it's Peter, you know, Peter, the disciple, Simon Peter, who runs all the way to the tomb, uh, but he doesn't come back in Luke's gospel. He doesn't come back to the other disciples right away. He is so overcome with what he sees or does not see that he simply heads home. That's the way that Luke tells the story. You can, you can read it. You can read about how confusing it all was for, the, for, for them in those first moments of trying to make sense of what seemed to make no sense to them. It's really all they know is a hibber-jibber, right? Jibber-jabber, none of it coming together quite yet. And that's how Cleopas and his friend end up on the road to Emmaus. They also are going home. So it's a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem to their hometown of Emmaus. And as they are walking, they are talking through their grief. The year my dad died, it was the spring. So I, uh, I colored a, a big swatch of my hair in the front blue uh, so that my outsides would match my insides. 
And I was a district superintendent, which means I had a responsibility at some level uh, for a group of 100 churches, but I had no single congregation, no community of faith. And so my grief overwhelmed me. That year, I uh, purposefully sat in a, a neighborhood Presbyterian church that did not know me. And I can remember sitting there wanting simply to absorb their hallelujahs on Easter Sunday morning until I could find my own alleluia again. Because that's what happens with grief, right? It can make us wander on the road away from any faith relationship at all because grief overwhelms us, at least it can. So three days after his death, these guys are walking uh, on the road to Emmaus. They're heading home. They're going back to what they know with a story they're trying to make sense of with each other. They're so lost in congregation, I mean, in conversation, that when the stranger steps up to them, they don't even wonder where he came from, and they don't ask who he is. The stranger, we know as the reader, is Jesus, and he lets them talk through their confusion. Read the passage, my friends, and you'll hear the sorrow in their hearts. They say to him, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know what we've been through? Who doesn't know this great travesty of justice that was done to this man, Jesus? Grief is hard stuff. And in their faith tradition, there was no theology of eternal life, remember? Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus, by his death and resurrection, opened the gates to heaven. So they had no way of knowing anything about resurrection as they walked towards Emmaus. It's interesting to read uh, how Jesus responds to them in their grief and in their doubt and in their wonder and in their confusion. If you listen carefully, you can hear the strange, the strains of what became an affirmation of faith in the first century church. These words, it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then enter into his glory. And then step by step, moment by moment, beat by beat, line by line, Jesus led them through the history of salvation, beginning with the words of Moses Evening is upon them by the time all of the conversation ends and they are ready to enter into their town and uh, they decide to invite Jesus for a meal and after supper was over, he took the bread and the cup, offered a blessing and shared it with them. And then he disappeared from their sight. Now, they had a choice to make at that point. I think when I read this story, they could have chosen to keep going on their way. I mean, Lord knows they were closer to Emmaus than they were back to Jerusalem. They'd been walking all day. They could have decided to go home to pick up the lives that they knew, to tell their friends and their neighbors that they had backed the wrong horse. That would have been the easier thing to do. But by this point, the men are so taken with what they've just experienced. The, 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 the flame of faith has been ignited in their bodies. And so they don't even think twice. They put the fire out and they run all the way back to Jerusalem. It must have taken them the better part of the night, and they find where the disciples are hiding at that point, and they run in to tell them about their own personal encounter with Jesus. And in so doing, they add their story to the stories of Simon Peter and the women. And in, in the next breath, Luke will tell us about Jesus then appearing to all of the disciples in the room and offering them his peace. And the weeks after Easter, 21 centuries later, their story on the road is a part of our salvation history. 
It's a story that moves us from being on the road alone into being in community. It's a story that reminds us that when we sit apart from one another, we have the, we have the possibility of draining our faith. Uh, we fan the flame of faith with one another. When I'm having a hard time, you prop me up. When you're struggling, I'm right here. It's as community of faith and as we foster caring for our community together that we become uh, embraced once again by the truth of the resurrection of Christ. There was no one in the tomb because Jesus was getting busy doing the next thing. Over the next 40 days, that would mean that he appeared to all kinds of people, fanning the flame of faith and igniting a purpose in each one of them. We are stronger when we're all together. You know that as well as I do. We share a salvation history. We've been through hard times, but we didn't stay there. We've taken enough walks right now uh, to last us almost the rest of our lives, and we're not done yet. But I'm here to remind you this morning that we are the church. We are the sign of hope for everyone who wonders what's it going to be like in the new normal. I'm reminding you that we must be the light of the world because Jesus lives here. And Jesus lives here. And in the resurrection of Jesus comes the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And you might, some of you who've known me a while, might be getting worried that I'm just getting started when I'm really just coming to an end. Because this is a story, my friends, that we can tell to each other day after day and Sunday after Sunday. You can share your stories of how Jesus fans your flame, and I can share the stories of Jesus fanning mine. We've got a choice, my friends. We can keep walking on the road to Emmaus, or we can claim our place right here in community. In this community, we are Potomac United Methodist Church, and what we say here is hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Every day, oh God, people are dying. And some of them are dying because of this virus, and some of them are dying because they have suffered for a long time with cancer and with other ailments. Some of them are dying from um, heart attacks and things that come upon them in the flesh of the light. But every day, people are dying and we are the church, O oh God, the church of Jesus Christ that seeks to hold up a light in the darkness. And, and every one of us, in the sound of my voice this morning, knows something about darkness and something about grieving and something about death and something about death coming like a thief in the night. And what we've learned is that we are stronger together what we have learned is that when we can share our hopes and our dreams, our sadness and our grief together as a people, as a community, old and young, new and experienced, well then, God, we are stronger for it. This virus is preventing people from gathering together for funerals. It's all happening virtually, just like this sermon and prayer are happening virtually. And hopefully people will be touched in ways that we can neither um, dream of or, or begin to imagine. So for everybody who is grieving today, oh God, and for everybody who's taking their final step, out of this life into the next. Expand our theology wide enough 
to believe that to each and every one, your open arms greet them with joy. Help us to remember as a part of our salvation history that, that your son, our Lord, came into the world to open heaven's gates. And, and we try to put a lot of locks and, and combinations on the opening when truth in your word is that you created the world and everything in it. So help us to let you be big enough this morning, O oh God, to hold everyone in their time of fear and grieving. Because what we know is that without you and without a faith in you, we don't even know how we would stand. Every day, children are hungry, oh God. And we have plenty. So allow our worlds to become wide enough that we will find places where we can share of our bounty. And every day, oh God, people are believing in you. And so we ask that you fan the flames of our faith this morning. Help us to remember that, that trying times don't last, that we don't have a reason to think that the darkness will cover us forever. Help us to believe that this is not about the end of the world. Help us to see that, that your creation is actually singing with new life. And when we get a chance to catch up with it, O oh God, help us to treat it with more sacred grace than ever we have before. Hold us close to your heart this morning as we raise our voices into one and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hope you find yourself deeply blessed this week, and I hope you'll find a way to bless somebody else. Until next Sunday, have a great week.